Good evening, everybody. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of Live with Lenny. I'm your host, Zach Dittmars, a production manager here at Fish Talk Magazine. Um, I'd like to welcome our host, Mr. Lenny Rudeau, Angler in Chief. Hey, Lenny. Hey there. What's happening, Zach? Um, you know. <clears throat> when when you, gave your official, you gave your official title and you forgot to add, and Fish Talk Kayak Fishing Sharpie. Yes, yes. I, I think that's official now. Maybe if you if you're the boss, you're the boss. So, I'm, you know. I'm I'm calling it official. So um, you know, I didn't go over the uh, topic for tonight. We're gonna do a, a deep dive into jigging, rods, reels, you know, lures, everything you're gonna need for light tackle jigging on the Chesapeake Bay. And I just want to before we get started, I wanted to mention that um, tonight's episode is presented by Suzuki Marine. So we're gonna have those guys uh, there with us during the duration. Um, thanks for everyone for tuning in. Um, hey. We had a great day of light tackle jigging on Sunday. Thanks for taking me out. I caught my first striped bass of the year. It was a 23, I think, but it wasn't a 34, which I can't remember who caught the 34. <laughs> oh, yeah, right, right. That was a fun day of jigging. It was very enjoyable and cold, and it rained on us, and it was windy, but it was great. I wasn't cold. You know, we're talking about gear tonight, and, you know, I was pretty geared up, so at no point in time was I cold. I didn't even turn my hand warmers on until the, the ride home, which, you know, I don't know if that's a feature tonight, but battery powered hand warmers is what something you suggested last year. The the battery powered hand warmer works really, really well, kind of shockingly well compared to the shake it packets you stick in your pocket. Like they don't cut it. Well, they need oxygen. I discovered that in my while kayaking in my dry suit. I put the the, the, the tow things in and then an hour into they, they my feet are cold and I, Realize they need a, it's a chemical reaction. They need oxygen, I think, to keep that the heat going. Yeah, but the battery operated ones are great. I love them. Yeah, I have three, I have three now, three sets. <laughs> and I have two sets of heated socks with battery, battery power heated socks. Well, I, for one, was cold and I didn't even put warm weather gear on the jigging list, but we are going to get seriously deep into gear tonight and we're going to name names. I'm going to tell you exactly what I like and why. And uh, I'm not going to pull any punches because I get these questions a lot at all the seminars, all the tackle shows. People want specifics, and we're going to get specific tonight. All right. Well, I'm going to step behind the scenes here, and I just want to tell all the viewers out there to uh, put your questions up, and uh, we'll try to get them in a timely fashion if they're uh, relevant to the current topic. So, uh let me know when you're ready for slide number one. Let's have slide number one. And don't forget, folks, as Zach just said, pop your questions into the comments at any time, and we will race to them as quickly as we possibly can. Um, so here we just have a big selection of gear, right? We got reels. We got rods. We got lures. We got sunglasses. We got a leader. We got snippers. We're going to talk about all this stuff. Go ahead and let's, let's just rapidly go right on to the next slide, Zach, because this one's an important one. And... Uh, this, this slide says a lot, okay? I know it's not giant. It might be kind of hard to see, but if you look at the, this, this is uh, on my boat, on my old boat from last year. I have a set of rods and reels that I share with everybody on my boat. And I'll, I'll grab four, five, six, however many I need at the beginning of the day. I'll put them on the boat and I'll just grab whichever one. And I've tried to make them all uh, similar, if not identical. So I can feel comfortable grabbing any one of them. If someone breaks off, I can hand them the one I'm using and take the one that they're using and re-rig it, whatever. Uh, the reel on the left in this photo is white. The reel on the right in this photo is silver. And here's why. Those are Shimano Stratix. The one on the left is a 2,500. The one on the right is a 3,000. Um, honestly, 2,500, 3,000, I can't even tell much of a difference, but the critical item here is how long has it been since Shimano has made a white strata? I mean, I don't know, 12 years, 15 years. It's been a long time before I was alive. <laughs> just kidding. Hey, hey, Eddie, I just learned recently, uh, I was at anglers and I actually was picking up a, a, the new strata and they told me the 2,500 and the 3,000 is the same body. However, the spool is smaller on the 2,500. I, yes, yes. I, I, I can't even tell. The, holding them next to each other, I can hardly tell the difference. Anyway. But that white guy is super duper old. Now, Zach, I think you might be a little older than it, but it is super duper old. 10, 12 years. It's right behind me there on the, on the rack. 
Uh, I still use it today. It's in service. And this is why I like the Shimano Stratic. These things are just about bulletproof. And I've used a lot of reels in my time. Most of them I get, you know, two to five seasons out of a reel. Now, I have right now one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven in service and one that's out of service. Now, I told you for, I, I told you I was going to get down and dirty here. There is one thing about the Stratic, and that is the bail roller. Every, say, with the amount of use I put on a reel, which is a lot, every, say, three to five years, the bail roller gives out. They, they still roll, but they get all scratchy, and it's just annoying. You got to listen to the sound. So you got to get the silly tool under the little thingy dingy, put in the new one. It's not a big deal. It's not expensive. But you do have to replace that bail roller every three to five years if you, like me, put somewhere around, you know, five, six hundred hours a year on your boat. Um, that's just a kind of a general indication there. And this leads me to the next thing. Hey. Tonight's episode is brought to you by Suzuki. Now, Suzuki isn't just a supporter of Fish Talk. I'm a longtime fan. The Suzuki you see on this boat, the, the two of them, those are 90s. Uh, I put over 2,000 hours and over 10 years, 13, 13 years of use, 13 years of use on those motors. They were just about flawless. And, of course, to go jigging, you got to do what? Get there. You got to get there. Right. And hopefully get home, too. So I'm calling the Suzuki a piece of it, too. Now, when I got my new boat this past fall, what did I get on it? One guess. One guess. Who can guess? Yes, a Suzuki. Um, I'm a big fan, big believer, love them to death. I'm so glad that Suzuki is a supporter of Fish Talk because it lets me talk like this honestly and accurately about how much I love them. Uh, so it's a great thing. Um, the other thing I want to mention, the rods, those are 6.6 six St. Croix uh, light action rods. It's light for jigging, okay? When you need to bounce around an ounce and a half of lead, that, that's, that's really light. Um, but I like it light, and I like to use the least amount of weight possible. I like to get a good fight out of the fish. So that's a personal thing. I got to say, you know, when I was a kid, the the – brand rod you bought was critical because for jigging you've got to have a fast tip and maximum sensitivity but these days an awful lot of rods are really 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 good so i love the st croix i've always bought them they're not a supporter but I, i've always bought them i've always liked them um i think it's less imperative that you worry about brand as much as you pick up the reel that you're going to go with Put it on the rod in the store and feel it and feel that rod and just get something that you like. You know, uh, why do I go with a 6.6? Six, six? A lot of people go with seven foot. Going to a 6.6, six, six, you sacrifice a little bit. <laughs> That's amazing timing, Norm. That's amazing <laughs> timing. Um, you With a 6.6, six, six, you do give up a little bit of casting distance. Not a lot, but you do give some. The reason I like a 6.6 six, six is because I do 95% of my fishing from a boat. And on a boat, you've got a T-top, and you've got antennas, and you've got stuff sticking around. And with a 6.6, six, you just hit it less. It makes it easier to crank back like over a hard top or get around rocket launchers. That little bit of extra length, it will gain you some casting distance. Some guys love it. I don't begrudge them that. But I, you know, I end up hitting stuff with my rod, and I hit less with a 6.6 six, six than I do with a 7. So that's why I've always gone with a 6.6. Six, six. That was amazing timing, Norm. I love it. All right. Let's uh, bop on over to the next slide here. So the Stratic is my workhorse, okay? It's what I put on the boat for everybody. It's what I use all the time. This reel you see right here, that's a twin power. I'm going to grab it off the rack right now. It's right back here. And this little gem right here is something else. It weighs next to nothing. It's as smooth as butter. Um, I really, really, really love this thing. But here's the big but. The Twin Power, 
is an expensive reel. I can't afford a bunch of these. In fact, I didn't even buy this. My son bought it to me for a birthday gift one year. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> um, actually, I think the kids were in on it. They got the rod too. This is a G Loomis. Uh, gosh, I'm forgetting the specific. It is a G Loomis IMX fast action uh, six foot medium fast. So uh, with this rig, here's the difference. I grabbed that picture in specific. You can see I got a redfish. That particular day, we we're fishing in about 15 feet of water over rocks. If you put on a three quarter ounce jig head, those reds wouldn't hit it. They wanted a half ounce jig head, just slowly fluttering down in the water column. But it got really hard to feel bottom with a half an ounce. And there were several people on board who were like, man, I'm not sure I'm on bottom. I'm not feeling it. But with this rig, with the twin power and the G Loomis, I could feel everything. And I could feel that little jig tapping down on bottom. I could feel it when that redfish slurped it up, uh, immediately set the hook on it. If, if I had my druthers and I had unlimited funds, I'd have, I don't know, eight or ten of these guys. So... You want to get your fantasy rig? I'm saying Twin Power G Loomis. That totally makes the grade. Now, before we go on to the next slide, I got one more to show here. I pulled this one out. Now, Zach mentioned we were just fishing uh, the other day. We were looking for bigger fish. We didn't get any real big ones, but yeah, 34 is a decent fish. And we, we were hoping to find that that 40 plus incher. And when you're doing that, you don't want to use this gear because those are fish that are getting released. And I don't want a 15 minute fight to get that fish up to the boat. I want to get it up fairly rapidly, get the hook out, release it in good health. So I upsize for that to a 4,500. And this has got heavier line. This has got 40 pound braid. Those have got, uh, it's either 15 or 20. And uh, this right here is a pen. Oh my, where's the, it's a pen slammer. Okay. And the rod is a Carnage 3. And this rod feels great. The reel feels very nice. It's got the ball handle thing. I'm not sure if I love that. I mean, it's, it's fine. Um, I think I like a regular handle better myself, but that's a personal choice. Um, and the truth of the matter is, uh, Pure Fishing sent me this to test and review a while back. And I like it. So it stayed in service. And when it came time, for a heavier rig to get a bigger fish up quicker, this is what I reached for. Uh, that 4,500 just gives you a little more beef, a little more oomph, and of course, having that heavier line on there is critical. Um, all right, why don't we go ahead to the next slide. Since I started talking about line, let's talk about line a little bit here. This is critical, critically important, people. Oh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> Gil had a question about uh, Gil. We'll get to you later when we get to lures. Uh, he's asking for your favorite lures. Lures, lures are coming up, lures Gil. Coming up. Just hang tight, up. man. Hang tight. Hang tight. Away. Who's that? Who's that handsome guy on the left there? That's my son, David, who was also fishing with us on Sunday. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, what you're seeing here, this is probably not the picture you expected to see. That's me way in the back there, standing back there by the car. That is Ryan on the right here. And that yellow line you see going through the front yard is a tape measure. We measured out uh, 100 feet, and I think it was 200 feet. And we were testing line stretch. And I bring this up because I mentioned I've got the braid on these rigs. I always ask when I'm at a seminar, is there anyone here who still uses mono on their jigging rods? If so, raise your hand. And there's always, like, there can be 100 people there. There's always, like, one to three. There can be 20 people there. There's at least always one who raises their hand. Folks, if you're still using mono for jigging, you are making a mistake. Here's what we discovered when we stretched out the tape measure and we tried stretching all kinds of different fishing lines. Uh, a, not only does mono have more stretch, we all know that, and vastly reduced sensitivity, we all know that. Here's the critical thing. You can just see in Ryan's hand, you can just barely see it, he's holding a hand scale. And we tested at the different distances the hook setting power 
of the mono versus the braid. With the braid, you're getting almost 100% of your hook setting power. With the mono, you know what happens when you rear back that rod tip to set the hook? It goes, your line goes boing, boing, like a rubber band. And uh, I'll probably get the exact numbers wrong because I always forget numbers, but you know, it was like, seven pounds of hook setting pressure with braid versus the same pound test, the exact same motion, the exact same pressure, two pounds of hook setting pressure with mono. It's that big a difference. So you just got to have the braid. You really, really got to have the braid. Now that article that we did from this test, if you want to look up the specifics, it's on fishtalkmag.com. Zach, I'm going to put you to the test. Can you put up the website real quick so people can see just what I'm talking about here? Um, because on Fish Talk, we do have a really good search feature. Okay, so upper right hand, you've got that little box right there. Boom. You can type in line. Uh, fishing line. Just line. You, it's real simple. Just type in line. But boom. There you go. Uh, and another thing it's really useful for is if you're going to go somewhere, Let's say you're going to go, um, you're going to go fishing on the Potomac, right? And you haven't been there before. Well, if you type Potomac into there, ooh, Zach's fast. <laughs> Boom, top ten Potomac River hotspots. You've got all, you've got all these different articles about the Potomac. You can do the same thing by species. You can type in red drum, and you'll get a bunch of red. You can type in flounder, and you'll get the flounder article. Whatever. Man, you're really testing me here. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, I, I think people have got the point. The bottom line is, you know, to find articles like this or for any any time you want to focus on something that you're not familiar with, just go to the search box, type it in. We got a really good database at this point. We've been publishing Fish Talk for well over five years, and everything we've published is on the website. So you can find all this stuff really easy and really rapidly. All right. Uh, Norm is asking four strand over eight strand. Norm, I can't tell the difference. I honestly can't tell the difference. Um, now, that does play a little bit into what we're about to talk about next. Uh, Zach, go ahead to the next slide, please. Because one thing you got to have is fluorocarbon on the end of there. You got to have your fluorocarbon leader between your braid and the jig. Zach, you know what I'm going to talk about now, don't you? Because you you banged me up the other day for telling this story for the 300th time. It's a great story. I was just saying I've heard it numerous times. <laughs> I have told this many times. This was for another article that I did. We tested abrasion resistance because I kept hearing, oh, well, the braid's not as abrasion resistant. You, you want the fluorocarbon leader on there. So when your line rubs up against oyster shell, bluefish tooth, whatever, it doesn't just immediately go to heck. So we tried taking a bunch of different brands and sizes of braid, including some that were uh, higher number, higher strain count, and some were lower strain count. And what we did was we we used the scale to measure pressure, and we gave them three strokes on a rusty grappling anchor, all of them. And then we tested the breaking strength of all of them. And what we found was the three was absolutely true. Braid has very poor abrasion resistance. When you start stroking it against the anchor, man, it very quickly loses its strength. It starts breaking like nobody's business. The, the, the mono, on the other hand, is very good at retaining its strength. And the heavier a test you go to, the more significant this becomes. And in the same breath, the lower the strand count the less, uh, the more significant it becomes, excuse me. So the higher strand count is a little bit more braid resistant than the lower strand count. Um, some people, I think, believe that it casts a little better when you have the higher strand count. I don't, again, I'm not sure I can tell much of a difference with that. Uh, I generally use Power Pro. That's kind of my go-to, that's my norm. I like it, I've been using it for years. I, I got no complaints. But if that fluorocarbon leader is not on the end and it rubs up against a dock, barnacles, oyster shell, any kind of structure, or if a bluefish grabs your jig and gets a tooth on it, it's just gone. So critical, critical, critical. 
you got to have the fluorocarbon leader. A lot of people ask me, does it have to be fluorocarbon? Fluorocarbon is so expensive. Well, uh, science does tell us that fluorocarbon is the least visible underwater. It has the closest visible refraction refraction index. And um, so, you know, is it necessary in the bay? I can't 100% tell you it is, but I know that I want to get every bite I can get. So I use the fluorocarbon every time. I don't go with the cheaper mono because if I do, then I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God, what if I missed a bite because the fish saw the line? So there you go. Okay, and Matt's asking, Matthew's asking, what about the visibility of the line of the fish? Um, well, you yeah, know, because you were kind of already answering it as the question. I, well, but there's more, but there's more, there's more. <laughs> With the braid, they don't care. They don't. Maybe they can see it. I don't know if they can see it or not, but they don't care. I used braid for years without missing a beat, without having leader. There was never a problem getting fish to bite. It was always an abrasion thing. Now, second question, does braid color make a difference? As far as I can tell, it makes no difference whatsoever. Now, I got to say, a lot of the guides like to use fluorescent braid because they have people fishing on their boat who don't necessarily know what's going on all the time. And with the bright colored line, they can see when lines cross each other and they can prevent a tangle before it happens. So there's the advantage to having a bright colored braid. But as far as the fish, I'm not entirely sure that they care. I'm really not. I do like the uh, the uh, the greenish Power Pro. It does blend in really nicely. I like the four color camo, um, oh, what's it called? Quattro braid. That's really good stuff. I've got that on a bunch of my reels. Um, but how big a difference does braid color make? Ah, you know, I'm not sure. Beyond being able to see what's going on, I'm not sure it makes much of a difference at all. I'm really not. Um, so Lenny, you talked about um leader end. Um, mm -hmm. hey Kevin, our good friend Kevin has a good friend, uh, uh, uh Kevin from the Annapolis Anglers Club. He wants to know what you use for backing on your braid and explain the reasons you do not fill the spool with braid. And maybe I'm gonna about to learn something because. I fill my spool with braid. So right down to the very end? I do. Oh, that's a little dangerous. Here's why. why? Okay. That's it. a little dangerous. So um, we know the braid doesn't stretch, right? You tie it directly onto your spool, and it's never going to be cinched down super duper tight. It's just kind of around it. And what happens is you usually spool up a reel in the winter or the summer, right? Whatever. In the opposite season, the metal spool will actually shrink or expand a teeny weeny itty bitty little bitty bit. And you would think, how big a deal can this be? Well, what can happen is the entire roll of braid can spin around the spool. If the spool shrinks a micron and that, that since it doesn't stretch, you know, it's not cinched with tension, it won't, the, the braid won't tighten up around that spool. And the next thing you know, you cast, and it seems like your spool is just spinning when you try and reel, but actually all your braid is just spinning in a circle around the actual spool. Have you ever had that happen? I have not. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised because you're an all-weather fisherman. I well, wouldn't. Um, so I do, um, you know, if it's not braid ready, the Shimano's are not braid ready. Um, some of the other reels have rubber um, around yeah, the edge of the spool. I use a, I wrap a piece of electrical tape inside. Oh, you're, you're, you're taking care of it then. Um, That's all you got to do. So, so let's answer. Uh, could, do you mind answering Lenny's question? What backing do you use? Is it do you match a twenty pound with a twenty pound mono filament backing, or what? And what so kind of knot do you use to join those? I'll tell you what I do. I put on about ten feet of mono, a heavy mono, like a fifty pound test or a thirty, you know, at least a thirty pound test. I, I'm not terribly worried about it. But I'll put on like 10 feet of a heavy mono, cinch it on tight, and then I'll uni to uni to the braid and pray that that knot never gets exposed. Because if it does, it's been buried under there for years, and there's a very good chance it'll fail. And if it doesn't fail, I've only got 10 more feet of line left anyway. See, see um, Robert's with me. Just wrap some electrical tape, just like I said. That's fine. There way. you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some of the other reels I had had some rubber. Yep. Uh, sort of 
spines sort of around the uh, inner spool, and those work good. Um, so well, you all like these to, methods will work. All these you, methods work. You just got You got to do something. I uh, do. You, do I put on a cotton jacket? I do not. I do not. I cinch the mono down tight, and then I tie it off, and then I start cranking. And like Zach was saying, if you got, you know, a, some of the manufacturers do now, they'll put like a, it's like a heavy rubber band around the spool uh, or electrical tape or, the, you know, anything like that will work. You just can't go directly with the braid around metal. So uh, we got another comment here. Uh, the Bayfish. <laughs> FG. I like the crazy Alberta, which is just a modified Albright. That's the one I use. So Bayfish, you're you're absolutely right. FG knot's a great knot. Uh, a lot of guys like doing this. Was it the surgeons? Um, Alberto. Uh, uh, I, I can tell you exactly why I use a uni to uni every time, no matter what. It's really very simple. My old eyes can't see the dang line half the time. <laughs> and I can tie it blind. I just know it by feel. That's why I use that knot, because I've been doing it so long, I can just I can I don't have to go find my glasses. If I want to do anything unusual, I gotta go find my glasses. And so sad but true, as you get older and your eyes start to fail, you want to be able to tie your knot by feel. So that's actually why I do that. Cool. Isn't that sad? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Another question from John. Right. How often do you replace your brain? Oh, so you know. Every season, I'll make sure to get rid of like 10 feet at the tip because that, that last little bit is what takes the beating. Uh, beyond that, if I don't know that it's touched something, heck, I'll use it for years. You don't, braid does not deteriorate like mono. Mono is susceptible to, um, to UV light. It deteriorates with UV. So if you've been using the same mono line for three years, even if it's got no nicks and nothing's wrong with it, it's still like that 20 pound test is now like 12 pound test. Like that's just going to happen. Um, but with braid, that's not an issue. And so unless I know something's up with it, um, you know, I'm always looking for the little, um, Ooh, like little, little bits of it hanging out like a piece of hair when you're casting that tells you that it, you know, it's scraped on something. You got a little abrasion. Uh, but if I don't see anything bad, I'll use it for years. No problem. So, um, we went crappy fishing down at St. Mary's Lake, and you were catching me like ten to one until you start giving me those little blue tubes. But um, but I was using mono on my lighter stuff, my sort of perch rods. I was using mono, and you were using braid. You were out catching me on the braid. You were out catching me on the, the blue tubes. But anyway, I switched over to uh, my my smaller one thousand over to braid since then. But I wanted to mention uh, and give some credit, a shout out to Travis Long. It schooled up, schools up, schools. Schooled up charters. <laughs> he changed this name. <laughs> was always kidding. Anyway, his suggestion was to, and I saw him do a talk and he said, you know, when you're taking like your 3000 reels and you're re-spooling, don't throw that braid away. Pull it down to like where you, the braid looks like it's fresh and use that braid to reverse spool your smaller. So you, if you're taking a 3000 and it's the braid is worn out, chances are the second half of that spool is going to have fresh braid. And that's, $15 worth of braid. So <laughs> just reverse spool it onto a smaller, like 1,000 reel and sort of recycle it and you'll save a little bit. Anyway, thank you, Travis. That was an awesome tip. And uh, I don't know. It's like a line uh, hack. Kind of like a line hack because <laughs> I'll tell you what, that stuff's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's not cheap. Right. But it lasts forever. I remember, in, you know, years ago when I was young, every year I would mm -hmm. re spool all my reels. Because it was all mono every year. And if you think a spool of braid is cheap or expensive, think about buying 12 spools of mono every spring, right? That was pretty uh, bad. I honestly, sometimes I think just going to the tackle shop and letting them use their, their mega spool is a little more cost effective. It might be. It absolutely is more effective in packing the line on the reel. It gets yeah. it on tighter. Right. Yeah. The question is, do you do you want to go to the tackle shop or do you have the line you want to do? So, all right, should we go to the next uh, slide? Because someone asked about lures and we haven't gotten into lures yet. We're about we to get lures. Um, 
you had some questions earlier. I think I missed it about bait casters, but David answered them, so I think we're good. <laughs> oh, so well, I actually had something special to say about bait casters because I did have one on the first slide, and I I was going to save this for the end, but I'll tell you right now. Here's the reason I don't have a bait caster to show you. It's because I don't have any bait casters. <laughs> <laughs> so the fact of the matter is, when you get really good with a bait caster you do have better accuracy than a spinning rod. It's a little more controllable, particularly particularly on where exactly you drop the reel. And I've seen some really good fishermen who can take that uh, chatterbait and literally drop it in a pocket in between the tree limbs this big and get in that awesome cast and catch a bass out from under there. Uh, the truth of the matter is, I just don't do that kind of fishing much. I'm mostly on the bay. I'm mostly fishing for rockfish or specks or blues. And so the, the accuracy does not have to be that pinpoint. And I am pretty darn good with a spinning reel. I, I can get it, you know, close and I never get a backlash. <laughs> so, and I, I don't care how good you are. Sometimes you get professional overrun. It happens, right? So for that reason alone, I don't I don't do the bait cast thing, uh, but I know a lot of really good anglers who do, and it is true they they have better accuracy than I do using that bait caster. You can really plant that lure exactly where you want it. So that's why I don't have a bait caster. Mm -hmm. All right, lures ready for lures. Um, got, yes. Before, before, before we move off the braid, there was one more comment, and I want to. I want. I'm going to ask you a question based on what he said. So snags suck on braid. So mm -hmm. first off, what is your technique for removing? We hit a lot of a lot of bottom the other day. What is your technique for removing snags on braid? Yeah. So Matthew's absolutely correct. Snags do suck. They do. If you grab that line with your hand and yank, it will cut you. What you do is, you grab your rod. You point it directly at the snag, you reel it tight, and then pull directly back. If it doesn't come, you grab the spool and pull directly back. If it doesn't come, you give a couple wiggle jiggles, you try popping the bail while it's under tension. Sometimes that'll pop it free. Still no joy, you have two options. Option number one is to reel it all the way down straight, grab that spool and break it. Or option number two is to move your boat to the other side of the snag and see if you can pop it out. And if you can't, then you're just going to break it off. And the, the critical element there is holding onto the spool so it doesn't let out drag, pulling straight back, and having your rod pointed directly at the snag. Because if you try and like muscle it with your rod bending on it, you might break your rod. Braid will break a rod. I've, I've broken more than one <laughs> in that fashion. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, my, my second question, based on his comment, um, braid cuts your hand. Wet braid is, you know, it's like, uh, that's why we use leader, right? Yeah. Well, when you're swinging a fish in, just that alone will cut your hand sometimes if it's a big fish. I, I know, Zach, you've never had that problem. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I don't like <laughs> no that is a that is another good reason to have leaders you can grab the leader um i've seen guys who have taken like a like a you know whatever a, a handle of something or a net or whatever and wrap the braid around it and then yank that way um i guess that works yep all right hey, uh, hey wayne Oh, hey, Wayne. Left-handed bait caster gives me finer and faster control for uneven bottoms. I don't know about Bob. I've never really experienced any lack of control on working bottom with a spinning reel. Um, but then again, I don't use a bait caster, so maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> what I see in that comment is the great debate over left-handed versus right-handed bait casters. A lot of people like using left-handed because it's the same, the, you know, it's – a, a, a right-handed bait cast, you have to cast and then switch hands. But mm -hmm. if you use left hand, it's just like your spinning reel. Anyhow. Hey, you know what? That's one of the beautiful things about fishing. There's no right or wrong. No one can tell you it's right to use a bait caster and wrong to use a spinner or right to use a spinner and wrong to use a bait caster. It's what you like. 
Uh, one last question I saw from Norman. No Thank you, Norman. You've had a lot of great questions tonight. So on a fly rod, he had another comment. On a fly rod, would you consider using a uh, floor leader a game changer with a sinking head while jigging? So I don't Ooh. on a fly rod, he said. So so on a fly rod, Norm, the honest answer to that question is I'm the wrong guy to ask. I don't know. I'm not a fly guy. I'm not I'm I don't know. I I put the same floor leader on my fly rod that I use. Well, yeah, I just got to know. <laughs> the same floor <laughs> leader uh, that I put, you know, 20 pound floor leader, fluorocarbon um, cigar. I I would defer to other folks who know a whole lot more about fly fishing than I do. That's just not my forte. I don't, I don't know what's right and what's wrong. <laughs> okay, one more. Bayfish, here he comes. More about the uh, a bait caster gives you an edge versus spinning reel. The bait caster will lose contact with bottom hit the spool release allows you to read the line and repage faster so that that just that button that quick release button lets you spool you know free spool a little faster than flipping the bail so i guess maybe there's an advantage there i don't like i say i don't i never have a problem holding it with a spinner so i don't have a problem with it but maybe that's the case maybe <laughs> you know you can get that little click and get it down there a little bit quicker i don't know yeah um so but again that's the lovely thing about fishing we can we can choose what we want. The um, when I got into kayak fishing, I, I guess people were uh, kayak trolling. You know, people like using the bait casters because it's a little bit set up more like a conventional reel as opposed to a spinning reel. So it gives you a little bit. You know, it's got more of that that winch action than a that you know. So, but I'm still a spinning guy. <laughs> um. I've heard that said before too. I've heard other people say that that it's easier to get right back down to bottom. But I was, like I said, I don't have a problem with it. David thinks that um, you can also maintain tension as well while letting the line out. Uh, well, David, I guess uh, 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 I, I would disagree, <laughs> but maybe I'll have to give a lesson on maintaining tension while dropping. I think I have a pretty good system for that, Dave. <laughs> All right. Well, we're kind of still. Yeah, let's keep up with the questions as they're coming in. So John asks, what type Holy of reel and line do you use for trolling? Uh, depend that there's so many depends right there that I can't even begin. What species, how much weight are we using, what type of lures are we using, what speed are we going? The, the that's a book. That's a book right there. I don't I've got I don't know, eight or ten different rods here that I will use for trolling at different times. But what I'm going to troll for mackerel is a thousand times different than what I'm going to troll for like rockfish, bluefish, whatever. It's a, it's a, that's a big question. And we're supposed to be talking about jigging. What happened to jigging? Oh, right. I'm sorry. Shouldn't even put that question out. <laughs> sorry, John. But that's all right. So wait, wait, I do have a suggestion. I do have a suggestion. John, if you go to fishtalkmag.com and type trolling into the search box, we actually had a series of articles, I don't know, three, four years ago, where we basically did interviews with charter boat captains. And the charter boat captains told us exactly, you know, how they lay it out with different species. We did one on mackerel. We did one on a mixed spread, mackerel, rockfish, bluefish. We did one on trophy rock. And they laid that out. So if you just type in trolling, actually, you'll get a whole... But again, it's like a book, right? You got a lot of reading ahead of you. So I, I, I've gone to enough uh, meetings where I'm pretty sure the Pen 300, 50 pound, either braid or mono, is sort of that. That seems to be a very popular choice for striped bass. Does that sound right? That Pen 300 yeah, GT, right. or yeah, you know, or the the Shimano TLD, same same size. Are you ready for? Uh, Oh, they're asking, asking about braid and trolling. This is a jigging. We have not gotten the lures yet. That's killing me. Okay. All right. <laughs> ready, for, ready for the new, next slide? All right. Let's go to lures and save up the questions. We'll, we'll see how much time we got at the end. All right. Plastics. You hear a whole lot of hoo-ha about plastics, right? Everybody's got their favorite style, shape, brand, color, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I truly believe that if you have approximately the right size and approximately the right color and you work it approximately right, 
brand becomes pretty darn irrelevant. It really does. Go ahead and make me big again, Zach, will you? I'm going to hold up some stuff. So this little guy right here, this is a Killer Baits 5-inch pearl paddle tail. It's my go-to. It's what I start with almost every day. I probably throw it 80% of the, 60% of the time, 60, 70% of the time. I throw it a lot. I throw it a lot. Uh, Gil's already popping in on, but that's my, that's my favorite. Yeah, this was, we're, we're, this was an old question that we. Oh, told. okay. That's when we held. Okay. You're kind of answering his question. I just popped it up. Okay. So weight, weight is purely dependent on situation. What I want is the lightest lead head I can get away with and still feel bottom. Because you got to be able to detect bottom. you got to know where you are. But you don't want a big, giant, heavy head that's going to sink like a rock. Um, so that's how I go by weight. So this little guy here will catch just about anything. This right here is a 6-inch chartreuse BKD. This is also, i got a ton of these on the boat. I throw them all the time. When I put a skirt on the jig head in the fall and winter, often, this... I'll pick this over this. This still works under a skirt, but I don't know. That's got a beautiful action underneath the big puffy skirt. And that's what I had on here the other day, which did prove effective. Um, so why do I love these guys right here? If I, if size and color are the only, you know, everything else works, right? Uh, they're cheap. They're cheap. These guys are like $27 for a bag of 50. Uh, I forget exactly what BKDs are going for now, but they're a whole lot less than a lot of the big name brands. Um, and you do use them up. Um, but I don't think brand makes a lot of a difference. Now, the tail makes a bit of a difference. This guy needs to be worked, right? You got to jig the rod to make him work. This paddle tail, I'm particularly inclined to hand this off to folks who aren't necessarily advanced anglers. Because all they got to do is throw it out in reel, and it's going to swim. It's always swimming. Always swimming. So if someone's a novice, paddle tail is a great choice. Twister tail is a good choice, too. But I, I particularly like the paddle tail for that kind of situation. All right, go ahead and take us to the next slide, if you would, Zach. It's just a close-up showing uh, just what this little guy will do in action. You can see this hanging out of the fish's mouth. Specs like it as well as rock. Uh, I'm going to have trouble coming up with a species. I have not caught on these. I've caught reds on them, uh, <laughs> bluefish, even some mackerel, uh, flounder, flounder like them, pretty much anything. That five inch white paddle tail is a killer. And again, it doesn't have to be this brand. It's just a, you know, four or five inch paddle tail. Now, with the specs in particular, I do like paddle tail in the five inch as opposed to the bkd in the six inch purely because i like it to be a little smaller you'll catch specs on this don't get me wrong but i think that the specs tend to like a slightly smaller bait name of the paddle tail gary is a killer baits k-i-l-l-e-r baits uh they're located in like alabama or something they're not local uh but you'll find them you can find them all right, go ahead and take us to the next slide. I got oh, one more. Questions. Lots of questions. Ooh, okay. Kevin's asking, you shared that a five-inch paddle tail and white is your favorite soft bait. What makes who makes your favorite jig head to thread it on? Okay, so again, I don't think it makes a heck of a lot of difference. There are some gorgeous jig heads that cost a million bucks, and some very plain jig ones that work just fine. When I was a kid, we used to use unpainted lead heads because we could make them and they were cheap and they worked. Um, now that said, the one thing is I like a jig head. I actually like the BKD jig heads, I think the most probably, because they've got that double spine on the back that holds that jig on there and it holds it on there really good. And someone said to me the other day, do you use super glue? And I was like, no, I don't. Why don't I? Well, because I got the jig head with it. Oh my God, there it is again. <laughs> I don't. It's a personal thing. I like to be able to take the head, tie it on, shove it on, go. It's a, the, you know, the glue is another step. It takes me more time to get my rig ready. Um, God bless you. If you want to do that, that's fine. And it does work. It works good. I've seen other people do it. 
Uh, same thing with the Z-Man stretching method. That Zach, you're the one that showed me this. You can take a Z-Man and put your hook through the end of the lure and actually lift it back over the eye and then tie the lure on. And that sucker isn't coming off. It works really, really well. But that's another step, right? So it's a trade-off. Pick your poison. You know, take a little longer to rig it. It lasts a little longer. Uh, personally, I like the jig head that's got the little uh, barbs. There we go. It's got the little barbs. You can just shove it, shove it on, and go. That, but that's just me. If you if you like the glue, go for the glue. If you like the Z-Man's, go for the Z-Man with the little sticky method. Works great. All right. So, are we going to make it to the next slide? No, we are not. Just a lot of plenty. <laughs> What's happening? Hey, the hog fan. <laughs> All right. One more question. Do you use any scent on your lures? Oh, my God. Scent. Okay. I, Zach, I'm sorry. I'm going to bore you again. I know you've heard this story a million times. Uh, never. <laughs> <laughs> I do not use scent. And here's why David was on here before. David will remember this. When David and his brother Max were about eight years old, I had a couple of those uh, garlic scent pens. I forget what they're called. Spike it. Spike it. That's right. And my boys got a hold of those pens. And about 10 minutes later, my entire leaning post was pink and chartreuse. And so I banned that stuff from the boat. I was like, no more. <laughs> and I didn't use it for, you know, 10 years after that. And then one day, Zach gets on the boat. And he's got Procure. And he's got a bucktail with a plastic trailer. And he gobs that bucktail up with a Procure. And I make fun of him. And I tell him how my kids used to turn the boat all kinds of crazy colors with that stuff. And then he goes and catches a fish. And then he goes and catches another fish. And he did really kill it that day with the bucktail with the Procure. Compared to everybody else, he was killing it. Um... Now, since then, many people have used it many times on the boat. I'm not using it. I think there are occasions where, for whatever reason, when the fish grab that lure, if it's got the procure or if you're using a gulp, which they clearly love, they hold on to that lure. And I'm not sure it gets you any more hits. I'm not sure it nets you extra hits. But once the fish grabs it, they do not want to let go. And for this reason, I do keep a couple bags of gulp on my boat at all times. That stuff's stupid expensive. I don't reach for it unless I have to. But if I've got a really tough bite where I'm getting these little teeny nips and then the fish are leaving and they're just not holding on to the bait, they're not really going for it aggressively, I, I, I'll reach for the gulp. And I have seen those days where Zach whipped out the Procure and he's he has not fished me. I mean, that's never happened, right? That's never, 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 never. But once or twice, he might have caught a few fish using that stuff. Well, I, I like this. I like this, Lanny. Uh, I think he's referring to your old series, Got Bait. We need a competition between yeah. unscented and scented, like you did with live versus artificial. And that was you and uh, Pete Dahlberg, right? You guys. Uh... Pete was in for one episode. It was me and David and Max. And we went with different folks. Pete did one. Uh, Sean Kimbrough was on one. Uh, John Uckert was on one. We did a we did a series of them. I think we did four in total. And it was, it was if you go Google Got Bait, you can still find it. It was pretty fun. It was a good time. But I think that's a really good idea. Um, what it would take, honestly, is using to really do it right. You got to use identical lures over time. So we'd have to use the same lure with scent, the same lure without scent through the course of like a season and keep track of the results. So it sounds like that would be a killer article. Zach, it sounds like you and me got our work cut out for us. I guess we got to go fishing. That would be a killer article. It really would. We could just like go fishing for like a week straight. I, I like that idea. I, I No objection. Um, are we ready for the next slide? What, what's the next slide? Uh, <laughs> so the next slide is important for one simple reason. I, I mentioned color and size, right? You got to kind of match the size the fish are feeding on. Color, 
I love the pearls, the whites. I like chartreuse. That's also at the top of the heap. That's really 90% of the time that's what I fish with. Dark, really dark conditions, purple. Purple with glitter. That's that's a producer when it's really dark out. But there's one big exception, and that's speckled sea trout. For some reason, I have no idea why. There are days, and I don't know if it's 20% of the time or 25% of the time, it's something like that. There are days where they go gaga for bubblegum pink. Who knows why? It's the craziest thing. Bubblegum pink, some days they just love it. Other days they don't. Other days are absolutely fine with this pearl guy or the chartreuse guy. But if you fish long enough and someone on your boat's using bubblegum pink, there will come a day when the bubblegum pink catches 10 specks in a row and nobody else can get a bite. So bubblegum pink is one color that you always want to keep on board, keep it tucked away, make sure you have it. All right. Go ahead and bop us to the next slide if you would, Zach. So here is another piece of equipment I'm calling critical. This is long nose pliers. Some guys like hemostats. That's fine if you do. I find that sometimes the hemostats uh, bend a little too easily because they're so thin at the end, and I can't get a really good grip on a deep hooked fish. But you got to have something to get that hook out of a deep hooked fish without killing it. So long nose pliers, I'm saying, are critical jigging gear. You got to have them. Let's whip through th through these next ones, Zach. We're just going to blast through them. Go ahead to the next. Another piece of critical gear is your little snippies. Now I think these things have been around forever, but I just discovered them five years ago. Who, Zach? Do you remember who introduced me to them? Um, no, no, no. That was you. Well, I got, I got, a, I got a shout out. My dad introduced them to me. Oh God, they've been around that long. Or his brother, Frank Dittmars, introduced them to my dad, and then my dad introduced me, and then I introduced you, and then now my brother-in-law. <laughs> and I gave, I gave one to your friend Brian, and he goes, "Oh man, you can't have too many of these." I have three now. The one thing, the 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 uh, the line will break eventually on that yes. clip. Yes. And they should like partner with like Power Pro or somebody to create, put like a braid in there that just well, doesn't break. Cause maybe, or then they don't sell more because I keep buying them. I have three right now. The other, the other thing I've had happen is a little springy dingy that retracts the line. I've, I've had that give out. That's what I mean. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's the spring thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But then it always, yeah, that and it breaks. And, okay. you know, and they get a little rusty, but you know, I, I'm they're not. I'm calling them good for two years, right? Is that about right? Two, three. But what do they cost? Oh, like like 15 bucks? Yeah, they're like nothing. And these things are so handy. You can clip them onto your belt loop. You can clip them onto the back of your leading post. You can clip them anywhere. And they're always close at hand when you need to rig up. They're easy to operate. They cut braid great. They cut mono great. I love the snippies. I'm so glad you introduced me to them. Uh, since you did, I, I also have like three or four pairs. I mean, they're just, they're all over the place. So critical gear, I don't know, but is it something you should have? Absolutely. And as a, as a kayak angler, I have it right here because I can't uh, reach in for the leaning post. I can't reach for my, you know, <laughs> so I have it right here on my vest, ready to go. And that's really super awesome. So. Nice. All right. We got one more here. We got one more. Oh, the net. I wish this picture were closer on the mesh. So landing net. You want to have a landing net, right? Okay, fine. Um, here's the thing. The knotted nylon mesh that we all use for years and years and years and years, when the fish is in the net, the knots rub against the fish. They remove its slime. The slime is not only what helps the fish be hydrodynamic, it's a big part of a fish's immune system. And when you remove that slime, they get infections. So nylon knotted net, bad. Rubberized knotless net, good. You got to get the rubberized knotless mesh. And I, it's not like, I, you know, I, don't, I hate like telling people what to do and everything. But it's not like I want to guilt you or anything. 
but if you got a knotted nylon mesh net on your boat right now, throw it away. And if you don't, the next time you net a fish, I hope you remember this conversation here and a red flag goes up and you feel guilty because you should. Just get rid of the thing. No more knotted nylon nets, okay? It hurts the fish. Make it your blue cat snakehead dedicated net. There you go. Great idea, Zach. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. Use it on the blue cats and the snakes. <laughs> Don't use it on the rockfish or the sea trout or whatever. Anything that's going, going to be released should not be touched by one of those nets. And um, that net, that's a free bill. They make some really nice ones these days. They're not cheap. They're like 70, 80 bucks. They're not cheap. Uh, but they're really nice. They collapse. They're sturdy. Uh, the mesh holds up well. They're really good. They're really good. So, again, I don't want to guilt anybody, but I'm guilting you people. You got to have the right kind of net. You got to have a release net on your boat to treat those fish right. All right. Now, before we field more questions, I wrote down some stuff to make sure I didn't forget. What did I forget? I know I forgot something. We covered the baitcaster. I wrote down missing baitcaster because I was going to cover that. Oh, the missing sunglasses. I haven't talked sunglasses. Why haven't I talked sunglasses? Well, here's the thing. They are critical gear, right? You, you got to protect your eyes. Um, I really feel like it's a very personal thing. And different sunglasses fit people's heads differently. I've had sunglasses I've loved that I've handed off to David and he's put on and been like, Oh, these are horrible. And, and vice versa. Um, I've had some that I've hated that he's put on and loved. So uh, I've got some hooks that I really like. I've got, um, Oh, what are these guys? What are these guys, Zach? You know, uh, these fin -nors. Yeah. Got some fin -nors I really like. Got some coasters. I really like got some Smiths. I really like, um, it, it really is a personal thing. They pretty much, they all have truly spectacular optics. They really do. Um, the, the lenses have gotten so good these days. You kind of, you know, with a good quality pair, you kind of can't go wrong there. Um, but there's one thing I want to mention, and that's polycarbonate lenses versus glass lenses. Here's the deal. Polycarbs, I can't get more than like one season out of before something happens. I put them in a pocket with keys or I drop them, whatever they get scratched. And then they're never the same. They're basically shot. They're never the same. Glass lenses don't get scratched unless you get really vigorous about how you abuse them. And I've had some, uh, sunglasses with glass lenses last me six, eight, 10 years. So I always go for the glass lenses. Now, the downside to glass, two, two downsides to glass. The first is they're more expensive. Um, and that's just, you know, you get what you pay for. End of story. Uh, the second downside is they're heavier. And that used to kind of be a big deal. You know, 10 years ago, glass lenses were so much heavier than polycarbonate lenses that you could tell a comfort difference. I think that's been greatly reduced. Modern glass lenses, they're still heavier than polycarbs, but it's not nearly as dramatic a difference anymore. Um, so if you haven't tried glass lenses in a long time and you're buying a new pair of polycarbs every year because you keep scratching them, I would say try them. That would be my recommendation. But again, hooks, costas, uh, you know, they're there are a lot of really good brands out there that have really good optics and you're going to want to find what, what fits you and what you like. That's kind of the bottom line. Lens color. So lens color uh, and color for Chesapeake. Okay. Lens color depends to some degree on where you are and what you're doing. The bay, what's going to be best in the bay is not the same as what's going to be best offshore. Offshore, I like a blue. Okay. A really heavy tint blue. Uh, you can really see through the water well. Uh, in the bay, I like a lighter blue. Um, a gray is not bad. I'm not a green lover. I don't know why. But when you're trying to see through the water and see things like weed beds, shoals, stumps, in anything other than direct sunlight. In direct sunlight, I'm still wearing, wearing my light, light blues. Um, the least little bit of cloud, and the sun's low on the horizon, anything other than direct, 
those amber lenses are shockingly good. They really let you see through the water. And I do have a pair of amber that I don't wear all the time that I just kind of save for those situations. Really cloudy days, they can actually make it seem brighter looking through the water. Um, and again, when you want to spot that stuff in the shallows, very effective, very, very good. So, but again, you know, a lot of personal choice in there with, with the whole sunglasses thing. So that was what I wrote down. I see we're approaching the hour, but Zach, do we have any questions? Does anybody else want to pop in a new one? Cause we can, we can go a little late and field some questions. It's all up to you folks. Hmm. Um, yeah, we have some questions that we didn't get to that I, I marked and I remember there was some, weren't there someone trolling stuff? Uh, not specifically. There was one early on. Um, I'm just going to pop up a few of these, a couple comments. David says that he likes bronze and for say mm. marshes. He certainly spent a lot of time in marshes last year down in the uh, yes. Gulf. David David has been fishing the marshes. And I got to admit, I, I'm not sure I've really tried bronze much, but now I'm going to have to because I'm. If, if that's what he, that's. David's been in Louisiana, so he's been fishing some marshes. And judging by the social media, I would say he spent more time fishing on his kayak than he did on dry land. So I'm guessing he's right about that. <laughs> uh, Matthew says he's in Northern Bay. He likes the green gray. Green gray, yep. And yep. Uh, we got another comment here. I'm not sure about this, but uh, can't get diopters in glass, but you can get prescription in glass. Is that like a bifocal? I'm not sure what he's talking about. Diopters. I'm not sure either, but I know that Hook has – they have the – multiple gradient magno lenses i call them magno lenses i'm pretty sure that's not the right term but they've got the the readers at the bottom and then the clear at the top so when you look through the top you get no magnification when you go through the bottom you get magnification and and i don't honestly i don't know about the specifics on that with the prescription and the diop i don't know um now you keep saying hook optics but um i it's confusing because hook H-U-K makes sunglasses. But oh, you are referring to Hook Optics from Eastern Maryland. Yeah, H-O-O-K. Maryland-based company that has Italian optics that they sell. So anyway, I just wanted to clarify that. Because I, I have H-U-K sunglasses that are like cheapos. And they're great for like for like 50 bucks. They're not bad. They're like my knockarounds. I didn't even know that Hook H-U-K made sunglasses. Uh, yep, they do. That used to be. Diopter is a reader at the bottom. So. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know if those ones – I tested a pair for, for Hook. I don't know if they were a glass or polycar, but you probably know – you're going to know better than me if you've looked into it. So, uh, And that's kind of a big deal for some folks. It really is. Like I was saying earlier, to tie knots, I, I basically, without the readers, I have to do it by feel. My eyes have gotten that – Decrepit. Terrible but true. All right. So um, I think we covered everything on sunglasses, which is definitely essential gear. Um, I want to go back. We have a few questions I want to hit. And I don't have anywhere to be. Are you good, Lenny? I go, we can keep going for a bit, yeah. yeah. Okay. This was real early on, and I'm not sure if Tim's still with us, but Thanks for the question, Tim. I thought it was a good one. He wanted to talk about flutter jigs, and we went out with the folks from Anglers, yeah. and they were using those flutter jigs, and I'll let you comment on the rest. Yeah, so uh, they absolutely worked. They, they caught. They caught on them. In fact, as I recall, the biggest fish of the day was caught on a flutter jig. Um, I don't think – I'm not going to say they worked any better or worse than jigs. I mean, we were all catching fish that day. Uh, it's interesting to me that flutter jigs have – they've kind of exploded around here. Because it's they've been used for years and years and years in freshwater. It's actually a bass thing. Uh, guys, you know, years ago used to use them for for largemouth when they were in relatively deep water. Um, and I, I don't know if they just I don't know why they didn't make their way out there, out here in great numbers until now. But now it's kind of become a thing. Um, absolutely, they work. You know. Uh, the only thing I would say is, Zach, do you recall, did that flutter jig have trebles on it? I it think did. It did. What's that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I would suggest if you're going to use the flutter jig, get rid of the treble and put on a single hook because you will catch under, you know, undersized fish on them and you don't want to kill those fish 
the undersized rockfish. So, uh, you know, any, I'd say that about any lure, but I just want to point it out because they do come with the trebles. Just get that pair of uh, split ring pliers, open up that split ring, take it off and replace that treble with a single. And, and you really don't miss a whole lot more strikes. You know, I can't say I've done it with a flutter spoon, so I could be wrong. But when it comes to plugs, other, other types of spoons, you know, straight jigging spoons, um, you know, you, you, you really can't tell a huge difference when you trade in that treble for the single in how many fish you hook up. And you can tell a big difference in how ripped up the fish get. So, uh, Tim's still here. That question came in at 6.15, Lenny. Tim's been hanging out with us. Thanks, Tim, for hanging out Ooh, with us. Thanks, Tim. All right, David has a question. When do you use metal jigs instead of plastic? I thought that related since the flutters are metal. So Yeah, so yeah, so uh, the, the flutters will work alongside the plastic. I'm guessing Dave's talking about um, jigging, what I would call jigging spoons, right, heavy metal. And uh, I'll go to them when I'm trying to fish in very deep water and I'm fighting either a current or a wind and I have a drift and it's hard to get to bottom. So once you get over an ounce and a half jig head, you can use a two ounce, but it really gets clunky. Uh, and you can be in, let's say, 40 feet of water in a 20 knot wind or 60 feet of water in just five or six knots of wind. Either way, it's going to be really hard to feel bottom. But if you get heavy metal, you get a jigging spoon, you can get it right down there. And that's when they become really, really effective. If it's too deep or there's too much movement to hold bottom in really deep water with a jig, go to the spoon. Gotcha. Cool. Um, another question. We have a few more questions after. I think we're going to have to hold questions now. We have two more after this, and then I think that's going to be a wrap. So I was thinking about this the other day because we lost quite a few uh, jigs. I, I'm what? Is there such a thing as a snag free setup? I was that's what I was wondering. I was wondering because I use some weedless stuff for snake heads, and I'm thinking, how can I incorporate yeah it what about a bass jig, Lenny? The bass nope. jigs have a bristles over the hook. Um, and I was thinking, I'm gonna try to find a real heavy bass jig. So when we're well fishing I heavy wish, structure. I wish you luck, but I don't think it'll work. And here's why. Those are for weedlessness, right? Or for bouncing off a log. What we were hooking into the other day, what you're often hooking into in the bay is rocks, right? And most of the time when you snag the rock, it's not by the hook. The line is going through a crevice or between a couple of rocks or whatever, and the jig head gets stuck. It's actually the head, not the hook. And... When you're fishing for creatures that are in tons and tons of rocks, like tautog, right? Let's say you're tautog fishing at the beach in a rock pile. Um, one of the old tricks is you take your weight and tie it to a little section of leader that's lighter than everything else in your rig. So when the weight gets stuck in the rocks, you can break it off and save the rest of your rig. Well, guess what? Nine times out of ten, it's that weight that got snagged. You'll And you'll discover this. The weight gets snagged not the hooks. And so it, it's, you, I think you're still going to get snagged quite often. I wonder if I could use like a drop shot saltwater rig or something. Drop shot could work. That could work. I never thought of that. That could work. David's mentioned some jig heads that with a heavy wire, similar to weedless, but he doesn't think, he doesn't recommend. It, so. Oh, what about a drop shot rig? <laughs> <laughs> right past drop shot rig. Another video coming soon. All right. That might um, work. That's an yeah. that's that's a very interesting thought. I haven't tried that. So this, this tonight's topic was uh, regarding gear, and there's one piece of gear that I always note that you wear, and you did not mention it, but we had a great question. And I'd like you to talk about that piece of gear. One must have. Looks like uh, I'm talking about your float coat. He's talking about an anti-exposure suit, but your float coat. You're, 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 you fish with a PFD all yeah. the time in your in form of a float coat in winter fishing. Yeah, and I'll tell you something. When David, who is my son and I obviously love and want no harm to come to, when he got his kayak, guess what we got him immediately? His, his mom and I got him was a float coat. Um, so I, I can't tell you how many years I've been wearing one. Um, it's got the life jacket built in. It's incredibly warm. 
The float coat, uh, you know, that foam is great insulation and it's actually like the warmest jacket I own anyway. And um, I, I've been through, I think three or four, probably going back 30 years. And I tell you what, once we get to like mid-November, I'm wearing that thing right through like April. And you've seen it, Zach. I wear it when I go pickerel fishing, right? On a lake. Yeah. I'll still wear the thing. And what it's am I wearing? Warm. It's super warm. And what if am I, I wear the water, I got a life jacket on. And what am I wearing in my kayak, though? You've got the dry suit, don't you, when it's I really do. cold out? I do. Yeah. I pretty yeah, much wear that from November through March and April until the water temps have reached. Yeah. Anything I don't want to be in. And I actually started wearing uh, waders with a dry top. When it's Wayne, like, Wayne, w Wayne Young, when he came fishing with me this fall, he wore a dry suit too, and he had it uh, under additional gear. But he had on the dry suit the whole day, and he was very comfortable with it. Someone was asking about dry suits. I, I've had mine for like seven. This is eight year number eight, and it's an investment. It was about eight hundred dollars. But, I, but it, I'm on year eight, and the thing's like brand new still. If you take care of it, it will, so, it will last a very long time. So would you would you pay a hundred dollars a year in insurance for your life? <laughs> for your, right, that you're not gonna go hypothermic and drown. <laughs> I think my mother said, "Wow, you spent eight hundred dollars on a dry suit to go fishing. You certainly have your priorities." And I said, "I sure do." <laughs> <laughs> you're around fishing. Um, okay, let's well, let's lightning round some comments and questions. I, I forgot to Mike put another one up uh, regarding our last topic. Um, and he recommends football jigs work great in rocks and current. Yeah, I think he's right. The jig shape does have something to do with it as to how often you'll get snagged. You still get snagged, but it does help. I think Mike's, that's accurate. Mike's, uh, Mike's, I think Mike's like your neighbor. He lives pretty close to you. So. Oh. <laughs> great guy. We met uh, Heroes cool. on the Water. Uh, Mike volunteers for Heroes on the Water. And he had yeah. another question as well. Um, is line watching important when jigging for rockfish, or should it be more on field? So I'm on feel and I'm also feeling and I'm also feeling and I'm not letting slack get into my line for three quarters of a second. I, I am when I come up on my upswing, I'm slowing at the top of the jig. And when I stop, there's a teeny bit of tension and I'm dropping with tension and I'm feeling, feeling, feeling. The only exception to that that I know of that that a that sometimes is more effective, and this is ancient history, is when we used to have weak fish in the bay, it was very effective to come up all the way on your jig and then just drop your tip and lay the line on the water and watch your line. And if your line stopped before it should have hit bottom, you would set the hook and you'd have a weak fish on. Um, that, that was very effective. Uh, but of course, who's seen schools of weak fish lately, right? But jigging for rockfish, yeah, it's feel, feel, feel. I'm feeling for everything. And again, that's why I'm going braid, I'm going light rod, I'm going fast action tip, you know, light, high quality rod that's very sensitive. Feel, feel, feel. All right. Thank you. Um, I guess we'll finish off with a two part question. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put, well, first off, I'll, I'll say, David. Can you explain the best way to live a fish? But before you answer that, let's look at Kevin's question as well. If you don't have a rubber mesh net, then a fish gripper or a glove thumb species dependent is a good choice for landing fish. So do you want to touch on other ways to safely uh, land a fish? I, I think that's accurate. I'll go along with that. You know, I mean, rockfish, of course, you can always, you know, you can just use your thumb. The big ones will give you a little bit of rash, but that's a good thing. Because then for the next week, you're like, oh, my thumb's a little roughed up. Look at that. You know, it's, it's a nice reminder. Uh, and they're not going to really hurt you. Uh, of course, you try that with a bluefish, you will regret it. Um, the lip grippers are, are a good option. Um, you know, boga grips totally work. I'm not sure I got anything beyond that. Well, what about sort of the no no, like, you know, hands and gills? Gill plates and stuff oh, God, like that. You see yeah. a lot, you know, but I mean, with the larger fish, how do you handle that? Kills me when you see people putting their hands inside the gill plate to hold a fish that they're about to release because underneath of that gill plate is the fish's lungs. 
That's what he breathes with. We do not want to touch those, right? You can put a hand under the chin with a fish like a red. Fish like a red, if you've got, you do need gloves. But if you've got gloves, you can lift them too. Um, it is really very species dependent. It really is. And if you try and hold a cobia like that, well, he's just going to thrash and kick you on your butt. So, you know, <laughs> it depends on what you're talking about. Cool, cool. Um, one last question. I think that's a wrap and we will uh, close out. Thanks for everyone for tuning in. Um, this question is from Norm and what are you jigging in? And Lenny, I would uh, defer to Fish Talk Mag. <laughs> oh, that's messed up. But uh, Yeah, Norm, check the fishing reports. Um, where, where am I going to jig? Somewhere between Havre de Grace and the hot dog. <laughs> so, you know, it all depends. It all depends. I do, honestly, most of what I do is right out of the South River because I live right here and it's close and it's easy. But if the fish are biting up north, I'll go jig up north. And if the fish are biting down south, I'll go jig down south. And if the tuna fish are on the lumps are going to bite jigs, I'll go out there too. So uh, it all depends. And the fishing reports are the way to keep in touch and in tune. We do not hold back with those. Um, I, I give reports every pretty much every week that I've been fishing and they're honest, they're accurate. And we get, you know, Dylan, uh, Dylan Waters does a great job gathering all the intel and writing it up. And uh, yeah, there's Dylan. And uh, it, I, I, if there are many better fishing reports out there anywhere, and I mean for any location, then I sure don't know of them. I really don't. Awesome. Well, thanks again for everyone for tuning in. Um, I want to pop back in here and, uh, you know, it wouldn't be possible for us to do these programs without Suzuki. So, uh, yes, thank you, Suzuki. And <clears throat> if you cycle through our website enough, you'll find, uh, this nice little <laughs> convenient thing here to get you over to Suzuki's page. If you're looking for repower, if you're looking for service, just hop on to fishtalkmag.com forward slash Suzuki, and we have a whole list of Chesapeake Bay dealers. Now, there are other dealers as well. These are our participating dealers in our program. So uh, there's a whole map here that shows all over the Bay. And, uh, and you know, Lenny can attest, a lot of these guys, all these guys know what they're doing and uh, are all great choices. So. I don't know how many times you've heard me expound about Suzuki's, but hey, got a new boat. What I put on it? I keep, I keep boat. I, I'm shopping for boats, and I keep seeing non Suzuki, and I'm like, ah, you know, like, I wonder how much I get for that one, so I can buy a Suzuki. I don't know. I've, I've had some others, and I'm not going to badmouth anybody, but I've had some others. <laughs> but there, there are a lot of other great brands out there. You know, I don't want to discount the, the reliability of. Of other brands but um but you, you know you put your faith and you put your trust in suzuki and it uh, hasn't failed you so uh no it's been great got right now i've got got one on the big boat i've got one on the crab and skiff i don't i don't even know how many i've had at this point i honestly don't norm loves his 250. there we go yeah <laughs> more testament <clears throat> Well, it's good to see you. I hope we get to fish again soon. Uh, we got one month in the pickerel tournament. Now, Eric Packard, I don't know. He's texting me, so I don't know if he's on his computer watching tonight. <laughs> he claims he has not started fishing in the pickerel tournament yet. Hmm. Well, hmm. February's on. It's February. He, says he hasn't entered any fish. And I said, well, have you taken any photos with the CCA code next to your fish? You remember in November when he said he was going <laughs> to fly a fish on me? Anyway. It's not too late to sign up for the CCA Winter Pickerel Championship. We have a whole month of fishing. In my experience, I found that the last month was the best for me every year. Yeah. So I'm kind of sandbagging a little. I've only been out once or twice. And uh, I'm going to get there at the end of the month and see if I can get a few uh, big little pickles. Get them. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We appreciate it. And we'll see you next time. See you, everybody.